Good evening. This is Mae Bressel. The title of this program is One Hour Broadcast is World Watchers, and it's broadcast number 697, April the 15th, 1985. A friend from a Kazoo who usually works on Monday evening and can't hear their broadcast very often listened last week to part of the broadcast and mentioned a subject which comes up over and over again with people who want to pick up on World Watchers but find it's too complicated. The names are hard to follow, and they feel like they're just lost in a swirlwind of uh, information and facts they can't deal with. Well, their feeling is absolutely right, and they're not supposed to deal with it in that manner. You can't just pick it up like the evening news. You pick up a spot here and a spot there. It's not that kind of research, and it's not that kind of broadcasting. It's meant for people that want to listen every week. A friend will say, what did you say the last half of the program? My phone rang. Well, when I want to hear something, I take the phone off the hook, or I just say, call back, period. Uh, If you want to follow it, there's ways to follow it. Those of you who do know that. If you can't be there at a time, you can get the tapes. If you can't tape it or somebody tape it for you, you can buy. The tapes are available. I don't sell them, but there are people that tape it off the air and make them available to other people. The instant uh, understanding of news is absolutely impossible. Some friends turned me on to the cartoon Bloom Country, which I haven't, Bloom County, which I haven't read regularly like I do Doonesbury. Bert Brethead is the cartoonist. And just this last week, he had a picture of his penguin sitting on the steps of the public library saying, Attention, dark world of electronic gratification. I would like to announce an intellectualization. No more TV, no more boob tube. I'm going to get smart, he said. I'm going to learn something I heard it's known as, in quotes, to read. So he goes to the librarian and names some of the books he wants and the authors he wants and gets some information and says then, yeah, it'll be such a fabulous thing. I'll be allowed plenty of time, at least an hour. And then he looks at the book stacked up from floor to ceiling, overwhelming, and he says, or three And then the next scene shows him in front of the TV, munch, munch, it's easier to watch the tube. A lot of people don't watch TV or even own TV that uh, don't listen to Mae Brussel. But the point is that if you want to, once you turn it on, you have to understand that you're in the middle of a complex mathematical problem. How is this country going to stay as a democracy when people who put in Mr. Franco in Spain, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany want this country as a total dictatorship, resources, labor, and everything that goes with it. So uh, the understanding of that is a continuous subject. That's what I talk about. And there's no way that people can get any more than just an idea or an essence from any single broadcast. Also, there is a crazy idea about age, and I'll do more about that with Ronald Reagan's quotation about visiting Germany, that he thought that all those people alive, all those bad Nazis, at that time, we're dead now. Well, he knows differently than that. The San Francisco Chronicle has a story about the purchase, the soon-to-be purchase of a store named Gumps, famous in San Francisco for china and silver and artifacts, and a company from the East is interested in buying it, and then the Magnan family in San Francisco uh, are interested in buying it, several members of the Magnan family. Cyril Magnan has two sons, and they're the people that would be interested in the purchase. But the man making the deal wanted to include Cyril Magnan in that if the Magnan family got it he's and make him chairman emeritus of Gumps Incorporated. Uh, Cyril Magnan is the first cousin of my father. My father passed away at age 94, had all of his rockers, and was very powerful in Los Angeles in terms of religion and politics even up till the time he died. Well, Cyril said, no, I won't take over that job, even if it's sold to the family on the West Coast. He says, I'm going to be 86 in July, and I want to start taking it easy. So uh, he's going to step down. He's still chief of protocol for all uh, foreign dignitary and people that come to San Francisco. But because he's 86, he's going to slow down. That was just in the paper today, and it's applicable to some of the things Reagan's been saying about the old Nazis being dead, when today they're actually in positions of power, more power than they just had in Germany because they have access worldwide and can go all over the world and be accepted as financiers, as scientists, as dignitaries, where before they just represented that awful man, Adolf Hitler. Now, six senators went to visit the Pope this 
uh, past Easter recess when Congress was out. One of them was Paul Laxalt, the darling of the Hughes Corporation, the close uh, pal of Robert Keith Gray, and I'll be doing weeks of Keith Gray uh, continuously. I hope I'll have time to do that. But uh, Laxalt was there. He was one of the six senators visiting the popes. Other members of the group were Strom Thurmond, whose wife worked or still works for Robert Keith Gray, James McClure of Idaho, uh, Thad Cochran of Mississippi, and Larry Pressler of Sandy, uh, South Dakota. But the important thing is that the Pope was talking to them again, to Mr. Thurman and Mr. Dole and Mr. Paul Exalt, senators, I should say, not misters, but I think of them more as not representing our country, really. He was castigating them on abortions and telling them about the millions of men and women yet unborn, the, the monumental contribution they could make. And the important thing is that he cited to them the Constitution and that the United States must remain faithful because we are, as it is stated, one nation under God, our Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, liberty and justice for all. But it is very important to make this point that this nation is not under a Catholic God. This nation is not under a Roman Empire God. Organizations such as the Masons, the Grand Masons, and other secret societies were formed to get away from the Roman Empire, to get away from the oppression. In the year 1000, the Roman Empire were burning alive and drowning alive people that were rioting or labor leaders organizing for higher wages in Belgium. In the year 1000, the Inquisition came along 400 years later. People fled Europe to come to this country to get away from the prejudices of specifically the Roman Empire and its cruelty and the way that you had to think Catholic. Now, our nation under God with liberty and justice for all does not mean a Roman God. It could be Baptist, it could be Protestant, it could be uh, Jewish, it could be Muslim, it could be anything. If your God happens to be a redwood tree, I think that I feel more religious under a redwood tree than I do in the houses of worship, and I spend my holidays either at Point Lobos or Big Sur. But that's my privilege. I still believe in God who made the oak trees and the redwood trees. Whatever turns you on to feel religious is your God. But for him to go home and tell these six senators, you know, to keep stopping abortions and decisions over our bodies and our minds because our God is his God is a total obscuring of the fact that John Paul II, the Auschwitz Pope, the I.G. Farben Pope, is not the one that our Constitution was made up of. In fact, our founding fathers, I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong and write to me, not a single one of them was a Roman Catholic. Most of them were Grand Masons, 33-degree Masons. But I don't believe any single one, and even as late as the 30s when Mr. Alfred Smith was running for president, there was so much anti-Catholic feeling. The Klan was anti-Catholic. I don't know if they still are or not. But to say you go home and stop abortions because you're under God and he is the God, his interpretation is God, forget it. Now here, I have now I have two articles along religious lines, three actually to follow that, that I've titled About Time two of them about time. Two members of Congress have introduced legislation to prohibit private individuals or groups to aid counter-revolutionary forces in Nicaragua or anywhere else when Congress has barred this activity. That is exactly what I was talking about by separation of church and state. And I would ask people who are listening to this broadcast to write to these congressmen, Representative Mel Levine, in a rep, he's from Los Angeles, a Democrat, right to him in Washington, or Jim Leach, Republican from Iowa. There's a Democrat and a Republican. Send copies of my tapes if you have duplicators. Copy the sheets that go with the broadcast and support this legislation. Legislation. Representative Mel Levine and Representative Jim Leach, a Democrat and a Republican, said at a news conference that their bill is aimed to toughening what is the Neutrality Act, which forbids military aid by private parties to foreign groups and subjects the offenders to a $250,000 fine and three years in jail. Now, the private parties are the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, 
the Knights of Malta, the Sovereign Army of the Vatican, for one thing, John Singh Laub and the World Anti-Communist League, and his headquarters in Taiwan and South Korea and Asia, Southeast Asia. The article from the San Jose Mercury, it was on the wire service, says Levine said the legislation would target individuals such as former Treasury Secretary William E. Simon, who recently is putting up $50 million or $100 million to help uh, the Jesse Helms, the Obison fascist network take over CBS. They may name W.R. Grace and Chairman J. Peter Grace. He's the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States, and Simon is a Knight of Malta. And Prescott Bush, the brother of Vice President George Bush, another Knight of Malta. They are giving aid to the Nicaragua Contras. William Simon, reached by telephone, reacted angrily, saying, Nothing ever surprises me at what some of those jackasses in Washington will say. Simon, Grace, and Bush are members of AmeriCare. He said they simply ship food and medical supplies around the world, which was an outright lie. They are fascist to the raw bone and working for the military part of the Vatican that I've talked about. Nobody's going to have anything to do with what food we send, Simon said. Well, if you feed all the food for the Contras in Nicaragua, then, as I said before on a broadcast, then they have the money to buy guns. If you buy all the houses for the Contras and you buy their cars and gasoline and their airplanes or get, buy all their immediate needs, then they can, the cash is released to buy the weapons. Simon says that... Uh, uh, he says nobody is going to interfere with what we're doing. Representative Levine told reporters that the purpose of the bill is to ensure that once Congress enacts clear foreign policy legislation, it must not be undermined by private citizens conducting a contrary foreign policy. That's exactly what I was saying to you on these broadcasts that it is outrageous. And it can't get out of hand that when Congress says these people torture these people are cruel. They're not using our money the way they said they would, or they're using it the way they think we want it to be got, done by a few people like Mr. Dobison and Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond and Paul Axald and William Simon and that clique and J. Peter Grace. This bill would try, I don't know what will happen, but they introduced legislation to prohibit private individuals when congress is said we can't send it then you get together and say well we don't need congress that is what i said is a government behind a government i can scream my head off on these subjects but two members of congress have taken action and by tomorrow evening i will have written and sent some tapes to them now another hearing is taking place for a judge to decide and this is from the new york times the other was the san jose mercury march 20th 1985 New York Times, March 16, 1986, Philadelphia, Judge Hears Suit on Vatican, Federal District Judge John P. Pullum, Fulham, F-U-L-L-A-M, heard or oral arguments here today in a suit by a coalition of religious groups. The coalitions are Presbyterians, Baptists, Unitarians, Church of Christ, Church of the Brethren, and a Roman Catholic group called the National Coalition of American Nuns. There's not even a Jewish group here that I know of, or they're not mentioned. They're too dumb to do anything about it. But the chosen people are chosen to be ignorant, I think. But this is a coalition of religious groups who took before the judge, Judge Fulham, the issue of whether we should have a, a diplomatic arrangement with the Vatican at this time. Deputy Assistant Attorney Car General Carolyn Kuhl, K-U-H-L, argued for the government, saying that the suit should be dismissed. She's representing Ronald Reagan and Vernon Walters and William Casey and the whole CIA gang, Alexander Haig, that we need, William Wilson, we need that envoy to the Vatican. She said the court shouldn't have any jurisdiction over naming any diplomat, and the plaintiffs had no standing in the matter because they can, couldn't prove they were injured by the action. If we can prove that the Knights of Malta and William Wilson injured the United States because they send money when Congress said it can't be sent, maybe we can write to these particular people and show them the injuries. Lee Boothby, B-O-O-T-H-B-Y, Boothby, a lawyer representing Americans United for Separation of Church and State, 
Some of you might call who are in the East long distance call information. Ask for attorney Lee Boothby. Americans United for Separation of Church and State said that the establishment of diplomatic relations enhanced the ability of the Roman Catholic Church to compete in the religious marketplace and violated the constitutional ban on government support for religion. The group are based in Washington. Oh, that's where you call Lee Boothby in Washington. It's an organization of church groups and laymen. Congress banned formal diplomatic ties with the Vatican as far back as 1867. But in November 1983, Ronald Reagan appointed William Wilson, that's the man in charge of his own personal financial affairs, a Knight of Malta put in there by W. Uh, R. Gray, no, it's Robert Keith Gray, who wanted William Wilson, a Knight of Malta, as the envoy, and uh, J. Peter Grace is the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States making them the Knights of Malta. In their brief, the government attorney contends the Vatican holds sovereignty over small territory in Rome and, among other nations, it has formal diplomatic relations. These other religions claim that this should end, and it should end. For example, NBC had a program with Jane Pauley and, and Brian Gumbel of Rome Easter with the Vatican and big pictures. Well, NBC is a client of Robert Keith Gray, and the Pope gets all this publicity as if that's the only religion in the world, and they do get the maximum amount of quotations, pictures, interviews, such as at Easter meeting with Strom Thurmond and, and Senator Dole and Paul Waxall, three of the powerhouse of Congress and three of the younger ones that will follow in their tracks so that no other heads of states, uh, churches are greeting these people or have their own passports or their own postage stamps such as the Knights of Malta, so that the Vatican is everywhere making foreign policy and influencing the way our government goes. Now, there's another story in the Monterey Herald yesterday, Associated Press, you might have seen it, April 14th, gold plating alleged on military bases. This is while Ronald Reagan is cutting back domestic funds. He has requested to spend $226 million on 26 military bases, and the construction involves such things this article says, in South Korea, we are apparently going to settle in for one more 35 years. That will be 70 years in South Korea, 1950, and add 35 to that. It said the group is asking, Ronald Reagan is asking for $2.15 million, to almost uh, two and a quarter million dollars, for a chapel in South Korea, a chapel. It used to be wooden frame house chapels. They have to have a $2 million chapel in South Korea on the Army base and for Religious Education Center in South Korea, and then $1.2 million for a family housing management office. Not the housing itself, but the office is over $2 million. But there's your chapel over there. Now, one other item that pertains to all of this and uh, is interwoven with three stories that I am not going to do now. I want to get on to Ronald Reagan and the ceremonies in Germany and his Nazi friends. But there are three items, big stories in the news that each will take a broadcast or two or three of their own. I want to continue the Grace Kelly story. I just started last week and had to stop. I ran out of time. I want to continue the control of the news media, the people strangling it, how uh, Metro Media is uh, moving in and almost uh, merging to buy up the Phil Donahue show and these other syndicated programs with, again, William Simon involved with Metro Media as well with CBS. I want to go back to the Vatican, the Mafia, the gun running. Little Grace Kelly from the Philadelphia Irish Catholic, the so-called Princess of Monaco, and I want to go into what happens when the Hollywood Philadelphia Princess runs into the big time, big time being the Vatican, the Pope, the Mafia, the gun running, and the Nazis. What happens is you get your head bashed. That happened to Irish Catholic John Kennedy from the other part of town who wasn't so fancy at one time, wants to be President of the United States, or his brother Robert Kennedy. But also, because there may be a death in the news this week, I don't want to pass up and mention, because I want to do many, several hours on this, the sickness of the President-elect Tancredo Nez, N-E-Y-E-S, who underwent his sixth surgery in Brazil. He may still be hanging in here by next week. He may have died by next week. 
the story last last report on him just last week was Brazil president's elect condition getting worse. He's extremely unstable, and the doctor said now more than ever, his recovery will be t- depend on his own body's capacity to fight back. And the people there were crying outside the hospital, and there was a quote in the San Jose Mercury, all our hopes for a better life depend on Tancredo, and they're there praying every day, pharmacists, nurses, and so forth. Now, in 1964, right after Kennedy was killed by Permandex and that Centro Mondial Commercial and that network of William Stevenson and William Donovan and William Casey and RCIA, when Permandex operated in the United States in November 63, they went down to Brazil and by February put in a military dictatorship. And so for the first time since 1964, a president was elected to represent the people, if he could, in Brazil at a time of terrible debts. And what happened was that uh, the day of his inauguration, he that he was supposed to be sworn in, uh, he got sick. He, they thought it was appendicitis. It turned out to be a stomach problem. Then it went to his infections in his body, and his lung was filled with water, and he's been fighting. They had to do tracheotomy and so forth. And every day he has been getting worse and worse. The day that he was uh, supposed to be sworn in, the vice president was sworn in. Attending the ceremonies were George Bush, allegedly Henry Kissinger, the team that have been behind these assassinations and coups, the Vatican team uh, with Mr. Bush there, which was horrendous. Vernon Walters was responsible for the coup in the first place as CIA down there. Now the, he's been nominated to be U.S. representative at the United Nations. Um, the scandals of Brazil were just going to evolve and open, and the the vice president was sworn in at the ceremonies, and the president was in the hospital. The story broke in the Washington Post, uh, March 31st, on Brazilian bank regime crumbles. And this is practically the wealthiest man in Brazil, who was a friend of Ronald Reagan's, who's a business, business partner with William Simon, the Knight of Malta, who is a former associate and works closely or worked closely with Bechtel Corporation and George Schultz. This financier owes hundreds of millions of dollars. His empire is collapsing. He's going to go to jail. He's like Lissio Jelly, putting money behind and with Ronald Reagan, recognized him and set up his trips. He's behind in $545 million loan of a shipping company. He owns the shipyard uh, and the taxes. Over four or five million dollars he owes to the Brazilian government just in taxes. The shipyard has a debt of two hundred and ninety one million. He's one of the largest financiers, as I say, close to William Simon again, the Knight of Malta, and down at this this terrible uh so called uh, inauguration of the man he was in the hospital, George Bush, former director of the CIA, whose uh, family Prescott wor- Bush works closely with William Simon and Alexander Haig and Claire Luce, as I say, and J. Peter Grace and uh, the whole team of the Knights of Malta, Vernon Walters, William Casey, just when he's to become president, just when he's about to open up the scandal, just when he's to get Mr. Garnero, who for years has gotten away with sinking their debt into $10 billion, the Brazilian debt, Mario Bernardo Gar- Garnero. The story's in the Washington Post, and I'll do a lot more, but I just wanted to mention his name because he might pass away this week. As I say, he might hang in there. He might even survive, but what I want to summarize in the point I'm trying to make is that when you get to be head of state, whether you're the little Grace Kelly or little John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or this poor Mr. Garnero who's in the hospital, not Garnero, the president of Brazil who is so sick and in the hospital now, Uh, What chance do you have? The power structure won't let you get well. They won't let you run the country. They let you have the debts, such as in Argentina. And then when a democracy comes in, they say, look at the debts. We're going to clamp down on you. So while President-elect Tancredo Nev, N-E-V-E-S, is trying to survive his sixth surgery and has bacteria and toxins in his blood, he could have a relapse. And the whole enclave that worked from from putting the Shah in power and getting Mozadok out, are working in 1985 exactly like they worked before. The guy hardly has a chance, you know, to 
get these crooks, the business partner, William Simon. Simon is there with the Metro Media. He's there with the CBS and Jesse Helms and Dobison. He's down in Brazil. And he's the one who is saying, when he's mentioned in this bill to stop his power in Congress, you know, those jackasses in Congress trying to tell me what to do. I'm William Simon. Well, it's about time somebody looked at these people, those names that I say over and over again, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them now. And any time you see their name in a news story, and I might have missed it, do as you always do, or most of you do, and send it to me. And then one final thing before I get to Ronald Reagan, and it isn't separate from his Nazi friend, Mr. Heinz, H-E-I-N-Z-E, Kissinger. That was his name, Heinz Kissinger. Henry Kissinger has joined a new public relations firm in Washington, D.C. This is the Washington Post, April the 4th. The, this is what the story says by Chuck Concani. Someday soon, the public relations industry is going to truly run the world. Someday soon, it is going to run the world. That is what I have said for years, that Mullen Associated, that was, association that was visible at the time of Watergate, is the Howard Hughes Organization. It is CIA. It is that office away from the White House, that can do what Congress can't do, such as sending James McCord and G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt to forge State Department documents, to lie about cables and history, to break into offices, to fix congressmen up with prostitutes, to photograph their bedroom scenes, to dunk them into a river up at Chappaquiddick, to blow their heads off. Those public relations offices do the work. Mullen, the next takeover from Mullen Associates is... Robert Keith Gray. But this article says soon public relations will run the world. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, consultant to presidents, and a ne any number of other things, has become a consultant to Burson Marsteller, the biggest public relations firm in the world. Burson, B U R S O N, dash, Marsteller, Marsteller, M A R S, like Mars and Star Wars, S T E L L E R. Mars is the goal of Alternative 3. Stellar is Fritz Kramer, the star war, the mentor, the partner with Daniel Graham, the mentor of Henry Kissinger. I wonder if Mars Stellar is a conjunction name, name put together. Very, I'd like to see Mr. Mars Stellar. This is the biggest published relations firm in the world. It has a large office in Washington, D.C. It's rapidly expanding in the area of political and legislative consultation. They will tell our congressmen, I guess via the prostitutes and whatever, how to vote. Henry Kissinger's office uh, announced that he will soon be a partner there. He also runs Kissinger Associates with former partner uh, Lord Carrington, who's now the head of NATO. So again, Kissinger ties up all the little packages and parcels of this world he and his Fritz Kramer are numero uno, in my mind, pulling the strings on people like Ronald Reagan or uh, George Bush or even, you know, Jerry Ford. And you see Jimmy Carter, the conference they had last week in Georgia. The numero uno is Fritz Kramer and Henry Kissinger. And now he joins this group on matters, political and legislative. You know what he did in South America, Central America, Asia, the Middle East. What expertise can he offer these countries? So this is from the Washington Post. If he were not alive today, I believe the father of public relations would be amazed to see what he hath wrought. If he were alive, pardon me, if he were alive, a man named Ivy Lee was the father of public relations. And after announcing that Kissinger is in there, they say he would be amazed to see what he hath wrought. Well, we'll be amazed to see what Kissinger does with that office. This is a, another horrendous step of another piece of power. The minute there's a conference in Atlanta, Kissinger's on the news. The minute there is an opinion in a congressman go to the Soviet Union to meet with Gorbachev, Kissinger is on CNN, Ted Turner's program with Freeman Reports for an hour. Kissinger is everywhere. ABC, CBS, NBC, cable news every conference, public relations, and now he will goad these people to push the policies, which are the policies of Z of Pakistan, of Pinochet, of Chile, of uh, Jung, can't pronounce his name, the president of South Korea, I should know it by now, 
I read it enough but never even bother to spell it out. I should. That's a terrible mistake. But I said Papa Doc and Haiti, and the work Henry Kissinger does is with every dictatorship. So he's got one more foot in the largest public relations firm now to advise in political and lobbying work with politicians, not only in the United States, but heads of states all over Europe. We'll take a one-minute break here and then go on to Ronald Reagan and the turmoil or the problem of uh, controversy, his visiting the graves of the Gestapo, honoring the SS Gestapo when he goes to visit Germany. This is Mae Bressel. The program is titled World Watchers. It's the second half of a one-hour program. I always forget to tell you that if you missed one half of this or you missed several weeks before or programs that I referred to in the past, uh, there are tape cassettes available of these back broadcasts. And also, if you wanted printed sheets with the resources, the material, the sources of uh, newspapers and articles that I use upon which I base this broadcast and other programs, you can write to me and get and send a self-addressed stamped envelope, and I'll give you information on how to obtain the bibliography sheets for the particular broadcast. I always suggest that you get a three-hole cutter or just punch a hole and put them in a three-hole notebook in chronological order. I may as well say you can write, give me the address. I always forget to do that, too. We seem to be running out of time so fast. So we'll start at the beginning. Write May Brussel, P.O. Box 22511, Carmel 93922. And I'll tell you how to get sheets or broadcasts that you might have missed. And uh, if you listen locally, of course, you can just tape it off the air and get the bibliographies through the mail. Now, the news report today, before I did this broadcast, that Reagan may visit a German synagogue to mute the criticism that he's going to honor the Waffen-SS and the Gestapo at their burial sites. White House officials said that Reagan may go to a synagogue in an effort to quell the uproar over his plans to visit the graves of German soldiers but not visit a concentration camp He's going there. It is the 40th anniversary since the war was over, and only Ronald Reagan would think of going to the cemetery of the SS Gestapo. Only Reagan because he's been groomed for this job since his General Electric days and since his movie days in Warner Brothers. I never for a moment doubted that he wasn't building up to this kind of activity, and I've shared my reasons for believing that with you week after week. He's going to visit a cemetery where German World War II soldiers are buried, and he wants to uh, acknowledge that the Gestapo died during the war. Members of the Soviet Union, of course, the Soviet communist paper Pravda, said that his plans to visit the cemetery is an act of blasphemy, mocking the memory of millions of people killed by the Nazis. To go to a synagogue is not to say that 80 million people I happen to be Jewish, and I'm sick and tired of hearing that six million Holocaust over and over. It wasn't just Jews. It was 80 million. There were 20 million Russians killed defending their country. And what right to think that to go to a a synagogue or a house of worship to let him in, a rabbi would be out of his mind, and most of them are, as I said before, I have so little use for most of them. Now, Ronald Reagan use the excuse of dropping out of ceremonies at the Elba. There was supposed to be a ceremony where the American army would meet the Red Ar- the Soviet army just where the Americans read the- met the Reds at the Elba River April 25th. Two weeks before the Nazis surrendered, the Americans and Russians met at this place. Of course, Reagan is consistent with the policy that our own OSS, William Don- Donovan and Alan Dulles, and, the, and William Casey and the powers that be had already been planning for two years to combine the Nazis with the United States, and General George Patton wanted that, and Mark Clark, they wanted to go on and fight Russia. But the point is that there was supposed to be a ceremony where the Americans would meet the Russians it, two weeks, as I say, before the Nazis surrender. The anniversary would be April the 25th. Well, when an American was killed... The uh, Ronald Reagan said an American spy 
was killed by the Russians recently. Ronald Reagan said, I'm dropping out of the ceremony. We won't use that occasion to celebrate anything with you because you just killed an American. Now, this is the typical kind of provocateur action that Ronald Reagan and our government have been so brilliant at doing, but Reagan is really the maestro. He's sort of the Toscanini of this kind of activity. There's three articles that you might might not have seen regarding the major's death. We're talking about the dispute over a murder in East Germany last month. A Soviet soldier shot a for an American major, Arthur D. Nicholson, Jr., uh, he was spying on the Soviet Union with some important papers. The New York Times has a story, April the 4th, U.S. Majors, U.S. aides differ on Major's death. The State Department and the Pentagon dispute between each other, our own aides, over the East Germany killing. A dispute is broken out between our State Department and Secretary Weinberger, the two of them, over the slaying of Army Major in East Germany. According to both the State and Defense Department officials, the issues have brought up fundamental disagreements between our own two agencies on what to do with the Soviet Union. Within our State Department and with the uh, Caspar Weinberger, who actually runs that Iron Hand, the Star Wars, and Daniel Graham, Fritz Kramer, and Ronald Reagan mentality and Henry Kissinger, the State Department versus Weinberger over the truth about that death. Another story from the London Times, shot Major's secret mission. The U.S. Army Major shot dead by a Russian sentry in East Germany last Sunday was on a key mission aimed to filling in a gap in Western intelligence. He hoped to spy on secret new weapons recently supplied to a crack Soviet first strike force station near West German border. Major Arthur Nicholson was killed while trying to take photographs inside the building that houses the tanks of the Soviet Second Guards Army at the base. It's 50 miles from a strategic port of Hamburg. Nicholson's driver reported yesterday as saying the major was shot in the back and chest, and Vice President Bush was there to receive the coffin when it arrived at Andrews Air Force Base. The Soviet units on which he was spying were described by a Western military observer as a prime intelligence target, just as when the Korean airline went down and we were using that plane and the pilot of the president of South Korea to instigate a situation that brought on all kinds of consequences. When Larry McDonald went down, it saved him from going to the court in Los Angeles with involved with the LAPD. It also brought Mr. Nakasone's weapons increase. It brought the MX missile deployment issue. A lot of things happened, and we were uh, watching the spies and spying over Russia at the same time. The London Times says that these forces were outfitted with his prime weapons, and the Soviets had them located in this particular warehouse, and that a close-up photograph of the new guns would have been very useful to the United States. A West German source put it, Nicholson could have been trying to get a picture, looking down the gun barrel that would show whether the gun had had rifling or was smooth bore and the thickness of the outer cating. So he was killed near one of the tank sheds uh, near road H191 on the way to Hamburg, the borderline there, 20 miles from the German border. He was inside there looking down the tank shed. His driver described how he was shot and what he was doing when he was shot. He was spying on the Soviet Union. Los Angeles Times, March 28th. United States officer concedes. United States concedes the officer took military photos. They said it was unjustified of the Soviet Union to kill him. But when they uh, set him up and sent him inside of a place to photograph a tank inside of a building, then the after he's killed, then Reagan can respond and say, "No, we're not going to meet you. We're not going to celebrate the end of the war." Then Reagan was asked to go to a ceremony or send representatives to go to Dachau and visit the concentration camps so that we would never repeat those things that happened before. And by March 22nd, there were articles, uh, Reagan bars focus on the past. He's skipping Dachau. Otherwise, Dachau spot was marked to be celebrated as part of the end of the war and the VE Day. There were to be ceremonies there, and Chancellor Kohl and his generation of West Germans feel that collective guilt is not a democratic concept and that they shouldn't 
feel guilty about what happened in the past, but the past is now, and we're not talking about the past, and the problem is that there's too much emphasis on the past. The West German officials had urged Reagan not to visit Dachau because Kohl plans to visit another camp, Bergen-Belsen, in the northwest of Germany next month. Now, I have a feeling about Dachau that I know that Fritz Kramer, Hitler's Fritz Kramer, was number 33 prisoner at Dachau, a Nazi who represented Hitler, along with Mr. Piper and Mr. Dietrich, who got out, that Senator Joe McCarthy's political career began by releasing the Nazi defendants that were supposed to be hung or spend most of their lives in jail in Dachau, that Senator Joe McCarthy worked with Father Welch and people down Georgetown and the uh, Vatican in uh, promoting the career of Joe McCarthy in promise for return for his releasing these Nazis that were important, and that Mr. Fritz Kramer, who sat with them, has not been seen or photographed since any way, shape, or form. And I still feel that if Kissinger is pulling the strings now, he wouldn't want our president of the United States, who he pulls uh, those hands. He's Mr. Geppetto, the puppet master. I don't think he wants him at Dachau. And I think there's a reason why Dachau is particularly particularly bad for our president to visit from the standpoint that our politicians and our Cold War and our blacklisting came from people who were directly linked to getting the Nazis out of Dachau prison and because nobody yet has identified the man who is the mentor of Henry Kissinger, Fritz Kramer, prisoner number 33 at Dachau. So Ronald Reagan isn't going there. But by March, um, April the 12th, Reagan antagonized the entire world by saying that he would visit the German uh, cemetery where members of the German army were graved, uh, buried. Their graves are there. They say SS Gestapo, and this caused a lot of uh, talk show and even CBS and Evening News commentary about what was he doing visiting the graveyard of these Nazis, members of the Nazi party, and clearly uh, identified as Gestapo. Ronald Reagan justified his uh, opinion at a news conference March 21st. He said, um, he said, there were very few Germans alive that remember even the war, and certainly none of them who were adults and participated in any way. When Reagan announced that he would not visit Dachau on March 21st, he said there were very few Germans alive and that remember even the war. This is Ronald Reagan, your president of the United States. And certainly none of them were adults participating in any way. None of them are adults. He said that when he announced in March that he would not visit Dachau. But it turns out in April that he's going to the graves of the SS Gestapo and he tries to make us believe that it is not important that these people, that they're all under 40 years old running around there or 65. Now, there was a comment about that on uh, Charles Corral's program Sunday, April 14th. He was speaking to a CBS representative in Europe who said he had been to the cemetery and seen the SS Gestapo signs on the graves markings, but he said, I guess we won't be able to go there until everyone who was alive during the war is dead. Now, what kind of a 1984 are they giving us? That's one reason these tapes are important to get around and share. It's the reason why books, I use books. It's why I tell you who writes the books, tell you the newspapers and where to get the material. History has gone on for thousands of years. Every Jewish child that is born today or tomorrow bears the stigma because Judas decided to put Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago. History does not let us forget that. I've mentioned that before on one of my broadcasts. History is to remember the past so it doesn't repeat itself. And Sandiana wasn't the only one who thought about those things. History is to remember and never to forget. What does the Bible tell you about David, the story of David? The poetry isn't so important, or the Psalms. It's the fact that one small person with an ideology can catch the bully and the Goliath with the right stone in the right place. Might doesn't make right, and the history of the world and psychology is written in books, and nobody should forget. You shouldn't forget the Civil War, 
And if Mr. Helmut Kohl wants to forget, as I said before, he should throw out the passion play every year at Ober Amigau. Uh, history is to remember. And the flap about Reagan visiting and paying homage to defenders of the Third Reich and people who fought the Third Reich and put bullets into the bodies of Americans and put Americans into cemeteries is outrageous. Um, the quotation again he enlarged he said i felt that since the german people have very few alive that remember even the war and certainly none of them were adults and none of them who were adults participating in any way why should they have a feeling and a guilt feeling imposed upon them reagan wants to keep history under control according to ellen goodman writing a column to keep it under control and have limited access to it. Now, in celebration of the Battle of the Bulge, he's going to the cemetery where some of these people died in the Battle of the Bulge. I've collected every book I can on the Battle of the Bulge. The latest one is called A Time for Trumpets, The Untold Story of the Battle of the Bulge. It mentions Hitler's Fritz Kramer just in about two places. It's about an 800-page book, 712. There was a review of it in the Washington Times just March the 14th, but in it it refers to Joachim Piper, J-O-A-C-H-I-M Piper, a brilliant, ruthless commander, a favorite of Hitler's. Piper and Sepp Dietrich, S-E-P-P Dietrich, just like Marlene Dietrich, and Fritz Kramer and Otto Skorzeny were the favorites of Adolf Hitler, and Hitler had made a deal for them, and of course, as I say, Piper, Dietrich, Kramer, Skorzeny were all free. Where is Kramer today? I believe he's the plans officer retired from the Pentagon running the Star War operation now. They're dead. Ronald Reagan thinks they're dead. They're old. Don't remember. They don't have all Alzheimer's disease and plenty remember. For those of you who don't have the broadcast I did, there's several broadcasts on Hitler's diary. One was uh, December 26, 1983, a year and a half ago. Uh, this and I took this from the London Times, and I did actually four broadcasts on Hitler's diary and the Nazis who are alive today and the 5.3 million, it's between 3 and 5 million, that went to the living Waffen-SS, the Gestapo, the dead ones Reagan will visit in the cemetery, the living are around. Uh, this this uh, series of articles and tapes I did went into Mr. Medard Clapper, K-L-A-P-P-E-R, SS Guard, the head of the Leaves and Dart, who worked with Mr. Heidemann and helped get the money they sold what were supposed to be forged, and we won't go back into that again. You can get my bad tapes. They are the head. Leaves and Dart was the death head. He was the head of it. Uh, Mr. Clapper is alive today. Mr. Wilhelm Monke, M-O-H-N-K-E, who worked in the Battle of the Bulge with Fritz Kramer and Skorzeny and Piper and Dietrich, who was in the bunker when Hitler and Martin Bormann and all of them were able, I believe Hitler left with them. There's no reason to die, but that's not the point. He was the last person in the bunker with him. He's still alive. He's a member of the elite Libsden Dart, sworn to obedience. He was started as a concentration camp guard. You can read about him in the order of the death head. Fritz Stiefel, He's still around, S-T-I-E-F-E-L. He's a collector of Nazi artifacts. He wanted to buy Hitler's, uh, the yacht of Goering. Hitler's yacht is, was in Florida. It's being moved up to New England, and I follow that route of Hitler's yacht. They're going to make a memorial of that soon, and people will be visiting Hitler's yacht. It's in the United States. Uh, this fellow wanted uh, Goering's yacht. That's where Gerd Heidemann, who set up the various Nazis from the Waffen-SS, all met together to plan uh, reunions, and they're all out of camps. They're alive today. They will greet Ronald Reagan at the cemetery, I'm sure. Mr. Fritz Stiefel, the collector of artifacts. Jacob Tiffenthayer, T-I-E-F-E-N-T-H-A-I-E-R, of the Waffen-SS, with General Fritz Kramer. And Mr. Monkey, he works, he was chief of audiovisual of the United States Army in Germany, West Germany. He'll be at the cemetery, I'm sure along with Ronald Reagan, Eric Kemke of the Waffen-SS, Hitler's driver. He's still alive. He's the head of the Hague. Alexander Hague, spelled backwards, H-I-A-G. H-I-A-G is actually the fundraising group for the Waffen-SS, the living Waffen-SS. Mr. Kemke can go to the party 
when Ronald Reagan's in Germany. The driver is alive very well, as is, we, course, we know Joseph Mengele is floating around. He could go there. He went to his father's funeral. He could be in the entourage to see Ronald Reagan at the cemetery, the Waffen SS. Conrad Kuje, K U J A I, he re- says he wrote the Hitler's diary. He's called a compulsive liar. He didn't get hurt by it. The trial's been going on for six months in London. He's around and collects memorabilia and gets to them. And uh, he only made between three to five million for the Waffen SS, given through the London Times. That's Rupert Murdoch, the same Murdoch that bought 50% of 20th Century Fox, partner now with Mr. Davis. Marvin Davis. Uh, that money was raised by London Times and the one paper in Germany. Authenticated diaries goes right to The Hague. Gert Heidemann, the close friend of Mrs. Goering, uh, close to all the top Nazis, the organizer, the German who first produced and sold the diaries. He got $5 million for the diaries from Stern. I'm just reading some names off the broadcast that I had and from the London Times that was published December the 11th 1983. It's written by Gita Sereni, a well-known writer in England. You can go to your library and get your microfish and photocopy the London Times, December the 11th, 1983. They're all alive. That Ronald Reagan is a pathological liar and a destroyer of any truth whatsoever for his own purposes and to keep the fascism. As I said before, don't think when he was acting with uh, Errol Flynn, co-starring when Flynn was in the Gestapo, that that swastika wasn't underneath his shirt or rubbing off. The idea to say that there are very few Germans alive that remember the war and none of them adults that participated in any way would be around is a lie, 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 and this man should be called for that kind of garbage. And I'll continue with some more names. Mr. Wolfgang Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z-E, living in Florida, is part of the Hitler group behind the diary and working with those. And Professor Eberhard Jackal, E-B-E-R-H-A-R-D, J-A-C-K-E-L. Uh, he's a professor who went who took uh, went to Stifel's house and introduced these various people, Mr. Cujo and the collectors of the diaries, and sold them to raise this money. Perius Medard Clapper, K-L-A-P-P-E-R, Waffen SS, travels around the world. He was with SS Carl Wolf. Carl Wolf was running Treblinka concentration camps while he was meeting the Operation Sunrise with Alan Dulles and William Donovan of the OSS. Uh, he just died a year ago, if he died, in Argentina. He only died after Bill Clarsfield was going to go down there and look for him, so they had a ceremony and something was in a grave with the Gestapo hands raised, the Nazi salute. Gerd Heidemann, Martin Bormann, Klaus Barbie, all of them Hague supporters, H-A-I-G, I put again, it's H-I-A-G. All of these people alive just linked to one story where they raised this money for the Waffen-SS. Now, I did put on a broadcast back December 84 how Mr. Helmut Kohl was lobbying on VE Day celebrations, and he said, Mr. Kohl said, in quotes, the most important thing is that one should think of the young German generation. They should be proud of their heritage, and they should be made to feel at home in their alliance with the United States. Pardon me, that wasn't Helmut Kohl. That was Alois Mertes, the Minister of State for Germany. And there was lobbying going on for the past year. Germany growing anxious about Nazi surrender anniversary. That's December the 13th, 1984. Helmut Kohl lobbying, December 27th, 1984. The Kohl connection that I had on the broadcast, December the 4th, 1984. Don't you believe that an American officer could be sent to photograph inside a tank, inside a building, 20 miles inside of East Germany to set up the excuse for not getting together? And the Washington Post, uh, the coup de grace, the icing on the cake, a picture almost five by seven of Ronald Reagan with John J. McCloy at the White House, making McCloy an honorary citizen of Germany. He was the U.S. High Commissioner, President of Chase Manhattan, Chairman of the Ford Foundation, President of the World Bank. He was the man who released uh, Hallmar Schacht and the Hermann Abst and Frederick Fleek and all the top Nazis out of prison, out of Nuremberg after four or five years and put them into business with Chase Manhattan. And, of course, Exxon is number one of the Fortune 500. 
they did very well with these Nazis, but the starvation and the deprivation around the world is a different story. The Washington Post says, Germany hails a friend. Now, this is what Jim McCloy says. I'm a little sensitive about my age, said John McCloy, who turned 90 on Sunday. He was America's first civilian high commissioner of Germany. He was made an honorary citizen of Germany in the Rose Garden. And then it quotes, West German President Richard von Weizsäcker cited McCloy's work in helping Germany recover from World War II. President von Weizsäcker's father was a defendant in Nuremberg, a Nazi war criminal. His son, the now president of Germany, Richard, was an attorney in Nazi Germany who defended his father, who's now president of Germany. How does Ronald Reagan say that the Germans are all dead that were there, that very few alive remember the war, and none of them were adults? He says certainly none of them were adults or participated in anything such as this. Now, McCloy got a plaque from the mayor of Berlin, Herbert Diep, Jan, D-I-E-P-G-E-N. He presented a plaque awarding Mer McCloy the highest distinction that Berlin can give. And Richard von Weissacker in the Roy's Rose Garden and the mayor of Berlin. And it goes on and on. Now, there was a marvelous article in the Atomic Scientist Bulletin on the Project Paperclip, the Nazis that came into the United States. I'm going to be sharing that with you. Subscribers to the tapes have sent me this copy, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, April 15, 1985. If you can, go to the library, and it's 24 pages, and photocopy it among your collection of material, resource material. But in the last few minutes, I just want to mention that the woman who wrote that story, her name is Linda Hunt, I've corresponded with her. She did a magnificent job. She lives in Washington, D.C. And just recently, not too long ago, she sent me a letter and sent out to other people, Nazis living in America that they've been trying to deport or identify. Now, this is just America. Can you imagine what Germany has? And she's been attending the trials of uh, Mr. Trufia up in Detroit. And she praised Mrs. Holtzman for her tireless work in setting up the Office of uh, Investigation of the Nazis, the uh, office that the Eastern Europeans want to stop now. They're trying to get legislation to eliminate the Office of Special Investigation, the OSI. They want a statute of limitations on war crimes. This is the Washington Post, April 3, 1975. The Eastern Europeans from these various countries, the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, the Poles, with their multi-funded uh, organizations, want to, they're lobbying to have a statute of limitations of kicking Nazis out of here, of eliminating the Office of Special Investigation of Nazi war criminals in this country, and they're sending letters to congressmen deceiving them on praising certain people in their areas that these congressmen didn't know were war criminals, and uh, Senator Alphonse Damato was complaining that he was duped into sending a letter because a member of Congress wanted him to praise somebody, and he found out that he actually was a Nazi war criminal. Well, Linda sent a letter about two years ago about attending, for people attending trials in different cities of people who did major murders around the country. I only have about 30 seconds to run down these. One was Jurgis Judos, J-U-O-D-I-S, member of the SS Lithuanian Auxiliary Police, trial was in Florida. Some of these have been updated since this letter. Luidas Carey, L-I-U-D-A-S, second name, K-A-R-Y-S, SS guard from Treblinka living in Chicago. Tal Avaldis Karklins, K-A-R-K-L-I-N-S, commandant of the Madonna camp, lives in Los Angeles. Serge Kowalchuk, S-E-R-G-E-I, then his last name, K-O-W-A-L, Kowal, C-H-U-K, a member of the Nazi Ukrainian police in Poland lives in Philadelphia. I have a list here of 25 people who ran the concentration camps. Obviously, I don't have time to go. These names, one is Arturkovich, who's now been uh, taken to a hospital in Missouri. He's not sent overseas yet. But a list of 25 cases that are supposed to be deportation cases of people who were responsible for running the camps particular camps in these various countries, the Ukrainians, the Polish, and so forth. But the decision to ship them to the camps is made in Germany. I bought a book when I was in New York on an atlas of the concentration camps and how the train routes went. 
So the German people are very much alive. But that problem is described in thousands of books you can get at libraries, at bookstores. They are around today, those very people who did it. The problem is the President of the United States, who's allowing the Vatican, William Wilson, his envoy, the Knights of Malta, to put in the Nazi regimes, the Nazi torture, in South America, Central America, R. Grace Company with J. Peter Grace and the uh, Robert Keith Gray, these public relations firms, Henry Kissinger, putting in dictatorships, going beyond what our congressmen even need or know, and being pressured by lobbyists of the public relations firms. And then the President of the United States going to the graves of the Waffen-SS, I've talked about Reagan. I've been on the air 14 years. I've never let up very much on him and his connections. I think you get the point that what I was leading to is beginning to merge. That was the genius of the serpent's egg, that movie that Ingmar Bergman made, where it stays inside of its little case, and you see it growing until one day it comes out. It's visible, but it can't hurt you yet. It nurtures. The serpent's egg is probably the most secret movie outside of the second gun that Ted Chirac made on the Robert Kennedy assassination. No movie has been so tightened up. Well, the serpent is out. The serpent is Ronald Reagan. That's what I was writing about. And the SLA is the CIA. And now he can visit the graves of the SS Gestapo. My time is running out. I've got to go now. This is Mae Brussel. I'll be back with you next week to continue with World Watchers.